I'm glad you're here with us today. Uh, happy Memorial Day weekend. There are some who are enjoying the three-day holiday, and uh, they are elsewhere. Uh, we got plenty of room on this side over here on the end of the row. Got folks looking for seats, all right? So uh, come on down. Uh, but I'm so glad you're here with us today. Uh, I just got to tell you, I had a great Saturday. It might be the best Saturday I've had in a long time, even, even on vacation. It was just a great Saturday. I wasn't pressured to do anything. I didn't have to be anywhere necessarily that I didn't want to be. And it was so cool. Our family did, uh, we, we, we continue to honor my mother on, uh, at one of the three days of Memorial Day weekend. Uh, some of our family, some of our relatives call it uh, ancestral worship. But we made the journey to all of the cemeteries and placed flowers on uh, all of our family members and closest friends who don't have family here. Uh, one of them that we stop at uh, after we see mom. Uh, and you understand when I say see mom, you know that I know she's in heaven, all right? But it's, uh, it's my Gilgal moment. It's where I go to remember, all right, and to honor. Uh, but just across the way from where mom is, after the boys, and uh, always make that stop, is then um, on, on the way out, there's a little, little baby, little baby. I never laid eyes on him. His name is Paul Hampton. His daddy was one of my, uh, my Bible college professors. Uh, his parents and my grandfather started churches together in Oklahoma. And uh, so longtime family friends, his, uh, his mom and dad now live in Tennessee and have ever since um, he would have been two. So they, they, they don't live anywhere near here. And so we always go by and we honor Paul. So we did that yesterday and then our family ended up at Chicken Pie Shop. Uh, <laughs> kind of our annual routine. Uh, great comfort food. It's still open. It's still since 1956. It is still open, and I've been eating there since 1956. <laughs> My uh, parents would take us there after church on Sundays, and um, 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 up until about a year ago, one of the same waitresses I think has been there all all of those years. Uh, she finally retired. But uh, it's good to have comfort food after a morning like that. And then, uh, son, I just poked around uh, the community for a while, did what we wanted to, ended up at a swim tournament at Clovis West to watch a niece uh, swim. And uh, it was a great day. It was a great day. So I'm really happy. I might preach really long today, all right, because <laughs> I'm just, yeah, really, really happy about life. But we're glad you're here. Let me highlight a few announcements, and uh, then we'll get engaged in the rest of our worship. Uh, if you have uh, elementary age children, Children particularly or grandchildren and want to connect them to what Memorial Day means, take them over to Alta Sierra Middle School, all right? That's on the other side of Buchanan on Peach Avenue. Take them to the football field on that side between 930 and 1230 tomorrow. I wouldn't show up at 1215. Okay, I mean, you don't have to be there right at 9.30, but I would show up at least by 11.30 so you have an hour there with your kids. It's not a thing you have to be there all three hours. You certainly can be. There is going to be food out there. There is going to be f uh, a flag ceremony and a prayer, okay, uh, with a short devotion uh, directed at that age group. There are going to be pieces of military equipment that the kids can explore. There will be law enforcement, firemen, uh, military personnel who will be present. There will be face painting booths and game activities for the kids. But it's all about connecting them to uh, this country. And so uh, this is put on by the Hubbard Barrow uh, organization, those of us who put on the uh, golf tournament on Veterans Day, uh, this is a way to connect a younger generation uh, to the price of freedom that those young men up there uh, have paid that price for us. So that would be a great thing to do to tomorrow. The pasta feed is next Sunday evening. Uh, information is in your bulletin about that. You can purchase uh, tickets today both to eat as well as for the raffles. $5 for eating, uh, maximum $20 for a family. So if there's five or six in your family, uh, you, get, you get off a little cheaper, all right? Um, you can also buy raffle tickets, a dollar a ticket, or uh, $20 for how tall you are. So take Tim Belcher with you, all right, and buy your raffle tickets, all right, for as tall as he is. And um, some of the raffle prizes are out there, but not near all of them have been turned in yet, but uh, those will be taking place. So you can stop and get those today, or you can also get them next Sunday. Uh, please take notice on most of the other things which are in here. The only other thing I think I'm going to highlight today uh, is going to be junior high camp. 
Uh, all of those things are due by May 31st, and you can go online and do that, or you can see uh, you can see uh, Chris or Brittany about that, okay? So please take note of that if your kids are in junior high. A couple of prayer requests. Uh, the Belcher's nephew, Michael, we've prayed for him uh, for several months around. He's been battling uh, bone cancer for three years. Uh, he was 23 years old, and he died on the 21st of May. His service is going to be this coming weekend, I believe. Am I correct in that? So if you'd just be remembering uh, the Belcher family, they would appreciate that so very, very much. I think I shared with you a few weeks ago, if you'll remember, uh, Tim felt compelled to go down a few weeks back and spend some time with him and make sure he knew where he was in his faith in Christ and had the opportunity to pray with him while he was there. And so we are so grateful for that. Uh, Glenn Hammock, uh, Julie Hammock uh, and her husband attend church here. Uh, Glenn is their cousin, uh, small world that it is. Uh, Glenn was in Dad's church in Fresno 45 years ago when I wasn't even a teenager yet. Um, and um, Glenn's been in this church a couple of times because they've been out to visit and they've been here for weddings and things. Uh, just got a call from them yesterday that uh, Glenn's been diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia. Uh, it is not curable, but it is treatable. He has just started a regimen of medications, and the prayer is that his body responds well to the medication. So if you would just please be remembering uh, to pray for the Hammock family, I know they would appreciate that so very, very much. Um, I'm going to ask our ushers if they would come forward at this time and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me, please? Our Father, I love you. I thank you so much for your son, the Lord Jesus, and his availability to our lives. Father, I want to thank you for your blessings and your sufficiency in the adventure of this past week. And Father, we thank you in advance for all that you're prepared to do in and through us in the things of the week ahead. Um, Father, you would have loved to have been even more engaged than we allowed you to be in what took place last week. I hope we have learned from that and we are going to give you greater engagement in our lives in the coming week. Most of us, we've got our day timers, we've got our smartphone schedules with our calendars on them and we think we know what we have to do next week. But Father, our calendars do not have surprises on them. Our calendars do not have the unexpected. Our calendars do not have the change of events that may transpire. But none of those will catch you by surprise and I trust and pray they will not catch us unprepared. And so this morning, in order to be prepared for the unexpected, we simply say thanks to you that you are prepared to meet our every need. You are sufficient to accomplish in us your every purpose. And you are more than adequate to provide for us what we need to face the challenges that this 21st century world is going to throw at us. So we trust you. And we give you thanks today for whether it's comfort or whether it's wisdom or whether it is physical strength, whether it is understanding your will in our lives. Father, we know that if we trust, you have provided. Thank you for the privilege of giving today. What a wonderful opportunity it is for us to share in your kingdom work, not only right here in Clovis and Fresno, but how you want to be engaged with your purposes literally around the world. We love you. We trust you. We give to you generously today. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. I had my Bible covering up these clipboards, so I forgot to talk about these real quick. And you get them passed around before the morning gets carried away. Vacation Bible School is coming up at the end of the month. Uh, there's two things on here regarding PBS. If you can't help out in any of the items which are listed uh, and bring those and donate those, that would be absolutely terrific. Underneath that is a place to volunteer as a volunteer. You can help teaching. You can help a teacher. You can do crafts. You can help with the food of uh, preparing snacks, uh, set up, clean up, any way that you can help. If you would like to volunteer, that would be terrific. Uh, also, the two sign-up sheets that went around for Celebrate Recovery last week for assisting in child care once a month or assisting with food uh, once every few months. If you can help out in those, those are also on these clipboards. And so those are coming around. The pins are missing. You'll need to use the pencil out of the pew in front of you. Also in your bulletin was a card, and it fell out of my bulletin, so I forgot it. Uh, it's about VBS. Um, for several years, uh, there's always been a fee to VBS, and there still is probably is going to be. Uh, we've never, ever... Uh, 
made it impossible for somebody to come if they could not afford. Uh, it was always underwritten. Uh, but we're, uh, the board had a very long discussion, our last board meeting. Uh, and, and so we'll make some changes for next year, and we're going to do the best we can for this year. Um, we don't want any family, both from our church or from the community. And, and, and one of the thrusts of the board was, let's make this more of an outreach to the community as well. And so we don't want price to be a factor. So the, the fee's been reduced, all right, to $10 a person, $25 a family. So if you've got three kids, 25 bucks is the most that you would pay. We don't even want that. So we're going to kind of follow the book sales principle we use around here, 10, 5, and free. <laughs> so we're going to kind of do 10 and free or 25 and free, all right? Uh, if, if, if a family can't afford, for, you know, even the $10, they get a T-shirt, they get their snacks, all the activities, then we are going to underwrite that. However, we did not figure that into our budget planning for this year. And so one way to help do that is if some of you would like to just donate something extra to the VBS account, then we will be able to underwrite the additional expense, which normally uh, came in by the higher fees that we charge. Does that make sense? So uh, that's what we want to do this year. We'll, we'll, we may just offer it absolutely free next year, but we need the time to work that in and also get your approval for that. So thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt worship, but... Like, oh, baby bottles. That's something else somebody asked me about. We're out of baby bottles. And some of you who are new today saying, oh, we're so sorry. Um, baby bottles, it's a fundraiser that we do for one of the ministries here in our community pregnancy care center. Uh, you pick up a baby bottle on Mother's Day, you return it by Father's Day, and you fill it up with loose change. It's called change for babies, but you can put dollar bills in it, all right, $20 bills in it. You can put a check in it. And since we're out of baby bottles and some of you have been asking, can I get one? The, the answer is no, you can't get one, but you could still give, okay? Uh, if you want to put something in an envelope, write on it, uh, baby bottle on the outside of the envelope, and we will see that all of that goes to Pregnancy Care Center just as if you brought a baby bottle back, okay? So that's the way around that. Uh, if you want to find your place in the Bible where we'll be reading from in a little while, it's the book of James, chapter 4, the first few verses. Uh, I am not going to take really much time to review today. If you are new today, come back next week. We'll do a little fuller review. You'll get caught up. Uh, we seem to be getting something that doesn't sound right. Seems to be in my back pocket. My mic. Should we just go to this? Okay. Because that really is annoying me. And I just did something that probably wasn't good. My earpiece came off. <laughs> That's what it was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this just means I can't move around much. Okay. <laughs> can, can you hear me just fine? All right. Um, you can also go online and uh, go back and see previous sermons to get caught up. We're in a series called uh, Enemies of the Heart. Just as our physical heart has uh, enemies like high cholesterol and high blood pressure, um, uh, our, our, our spiritual heart, that invisible part of us, which the Bible says um, is deceitful and desperately wicked, it has enemies as well. And we have been looking at those enemies over the last 13 weeks. Uh, the four primary enemies that we're looking at are guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. Guilt, all of these talk about debts that we owe. Guilt says, I owe you. So the solution, the habit we need to develop to get rid of guilt is confession. Anger is fueled by the notion that you owe me. So that debt is remedied with habitually seeking and offering forgiveness. Greed is kept alive by the assumption that I owe me. I deserve things in my life. A twisted way of thinking, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Thank you. He does far more than I deserve. Wow, can anything else go wrong this morning? After, it was a great Saturday. It was a great Saturday. <laughs> Greed is kept alive by the assumption that I owe me, a twisted way of thinking that we remedy by developing the habit of generous giving. And the fourth of, the, fourth of these insidious threats on our invisible heart is the problem of jealousy. And jealousy says, God owes me. From the beginning of time, jealousy has played a featured role in the story of human relationships. Let's go back to creation. How about Cain being jealous of Abel? 
And what was the end result of that relationship? Yeah, Cain killed Abel. Esau was jealous of Jacob, and trickery and deception occurred. Joseph's brothers were jealous of their younger brother's relationship with their dad, and they sold him into slavery. Commodus was jealous of Maximus and his relationship with his father, who was the emperor of Rome. Maybe you guys don't remember Maximus and Commodus. So how about this one? Woody felt replaced by Buzz. You know that one, right? When we think of jealousy, we think of things that others have that we lack. Things like looks, talent, height, money, health, connections, so on. And so we think we have a problem with the person who possesses what we lack. Tim is good looking and he can sing. I don't possess either one of those things. You see, so we, I, I could be very jealous of him because I would love to sing. I love singing. Those who stand close up here know. And that's why many of you choose to sit farther back in the service. <laughs> But often we think our problem is going to be with the person who has what we don't. But as we said, what we really believe is God could have fixed all that. Whatever he's given to our neighbor, our friend, our sibling, God could have chosen to give to us as well. The bottom line in this thing called jealousy is if God had taken care of us the way he has some other people we know, we would be in much better shape relationally, professionally, and probably financially. Our problem isn't with the people whose stuff we envy. It is with our Creator. He owes me, and I'm holding a grudge against Him. And until we face up to this simple but so convicting truth, jealousy will continue to terrorize our life, and it will bring havoc into all of our relationships. The good news is this. Like the other three, jealousy has a vulnerability. And it's something you might not expect. But before I share with you the solution, the good habit, I want to take a little time today to dissect the problem a little more. I know we did that about six weeks ago, but that's been six weeks ago. And so I want us to look at this a little closer again this morning. Why? Because the driving force behind jealousy is really the driving force behind every single relationship struggle we encounter in our life. Every one of them, from marriage problems to personal problems at the office to dysfunction in the church, all of them can be reduced down to one common issue. In fact, this issue encompasses and explains the relational rifts that are caused by guilt and anger and greed as well. If we can understand this one dynamic and we'll be free to quit blaming everything and everybody for less than attractive behaviors that find their source, guess what, where? In our hearts. Our hearts that are so desperately wicked. Today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you at the beginning. Right now, we're going we're, we're gonna to get ready, so get ready back there, Ryan. I'm going to show you a, a short nine-minute testimony from a guy in our church. He's actually in the service right now. I actually think he might be wearing the same shirt right now that he's wearing in the video. <laughs> I'm not sure. My, my memory's not working great today. But th this probably would have been a great testimonial to have shown on the subject of forgiveness. And yet, when you listen to this video, you are going to see or hear about all four of these heart problems. You're going to see what it's like when a guy struggles with guilt. You're going to see what it's like when anger rules the decisions you make. You're going to see what it's like when there is greed and jealousy that pops up in our world and causes us to make decisions that we would not otherwise make. So I want you to sit back and listen. I'm not going to introduce who it is. You're going to know right away, and he introduces himself. Hello, New Hope congregation. Uh, my name is Fred Mendren. Uh, my wife Lily and I have been attending here at New Hope for approximately six-plus years. And um, I'd like to just share some of my story with you. I um, went to prison in 1970 for possession of marijuana. And being insecure, uh, wanting to be accepted by the hardcore prisoners, I began acting in a way that would be acceptable to the uh, hardcore gang called the Aryan Brotherhood. 
and I was accepted in the in that gang in 1972. It was brought to my attention that somebody had done something wrong to one of the members, and I was the only one who had access to him. So it was on me to go ahead and uh, attempt to kill him. I told uh, the one member that approached me, I said, hey, I only have, you know, possession of marijuana. I could probably be out in six months, seven months from now. And he acted in a real aggressive manner that hurt my pride, made me con be concerned about my life. If I didn't do what he wanted me to do, would I lose my life? So I went ahead, myself and another guy uh, attacked this individual and ended up killing him. And I was uh, sentenced to seven years to life in prison. Ended up going to San Quentin and I stabbed three others in the next few years. And after the uh, third incident, I was in the LA County Hospital and I looked out one day, I looked out from the 11th floor of the hospital toward the ocean and there wasn't any smog in the city, no fog over the ocean. And I looked and I said, wow, this is what I am missing. And I knew that I said this out loud, you watch, Fred, when you go to back to San Quentin, you'll receive a hero's welcome from the men there. But if I would have died in this fight, they would have just talked good about me for a few days, and then they would have forgotten me. In fact, that when I went back to San Quentin, I did receive that hero's welcome. So fast forward to 1978. Um, I was in Folsom Prison, old Folsom Prison. They sent me back to the prison in Chino, the same place where the murder happened in 1972. And I was there for three months total. After two months, I was in my cell and all of a sudden, I just knew that I believed in God, believed in Jesus as my savior, and I had peace of mind that I'd never, ever experienced in my entire life. And I knew what I needed to do. I knew I needed to go out to the exercise yard the next day and talk with the one gang member that was there and tell him, look, I am dropping out of the gang. I don't want this anymore, that's it. And so I did. And um, he and I, a month later, were sent back to Folsom Prison. I stayed there for, uh, with the gang members on the same exercise yard for about six, seven months. And then staff finally believed that I dropped out. And then they moved me to another section and began just giving me favor. And then from there, I did my last five years in the prison in Vacaville and working with the prison ministry there, leading Bible studies. I got out in September, uh, September 1st of 1985. So I think that's going to be like 32 years coming up on this September 1st. And since being here in Fresno since 1995, I've worked with different various ministries. I'm a chaplain at the county jail. I'm able to go in and visit uh, men uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis and um, just to encourage them, give them hope that they could turn their life around through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I share with them, uh, I'll share, I share with them about my, the, the, I show them the picture of what I looked like when I was in, 19, in 1972, when I was going to court for the murder. And uh, then the before and after effect, I think many times will encourage men that they have, they could have hope, you know. About three weeks ago uh, for an Easter event, my wife, Lily, and I and the prison fellowship uh, team were able to go to uh, Old Folsom Prison, the same prison that I did time in between 1976 and 1980. And being there on the yard, looking across the yard at the one, at this huge building, it was titled One Building. Well, that's where I did my last year there. And I had asked associate warden, if I could be taken over to that building. And they let me look inside the building because I had done a year there in 1980. And he said, oh yeah, sure, no problem. He asked an officer to escort me over. So we went over and I was able to look inside, go inside the building. And there, it doesn't have floors, but tiers. So you could look up and see the first, second, third, fourth, 
tear and the clanging of the doors, the shouting, the yelling. Wow, Lilia was just amazed. She says, Fred, you've told me what it's like, but I've not been able to really picture it. But now I see it and I could see what it was like. And uh, then another experience I had there, they allowed me to go into the uh, building where I did uh, three years in the lockup unit. And I was able to share with an individual named Daniel, uh, looking through a little window and having to bend down and speak through the speaker below the window, I was sharing with him about the gospel. And I asked him, I said, Daniel, would you like to pray and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? And he just immediately said, yes, I would. So we, uh, we bent both bent back down to the speaker, and I'm leading to him through with a prayer. And... Uh, and then after we said amen, stood back up, and there he stood up and smiling. And I asked him, I said, had you ever prayed that prayer before? He said, no, never have. So that was just so awesome to be able to do. And I share with him, Daniel, I did three years on this floor right here in 1976 and 1979. So God has allowed me to come back in and share with you. Oh, gosh, the, it was just absolutely amazing. And I get to go into four different prisons now. Um, I go to Avenal, Colinga, Corcoran, and uh, the prison in uh, Chowchilla to be able to share hope and life with the men there. And uh, it is amazing. One one uh, little uh, story a gentleman was sharing about his life, how he was sexually molested at five years old. And he was sharing this. He said, this is the first time I'm sharing with anybody. I've held it in all this time. And we had been studying uh, this book called Free at Last. And it said in there, if you have something that you've never shared that has been bothering you all these years, you need to find somebody and share it with. And so he opened up. And uh, the, he opened up and then just began sobbing. And we all got around him, prayed with him. And then the next week, he came back in and was encouraging the men. Hey, if you have something that you've never shared with anybody, talk, find somebody and share it with them. Get it off your conscience, your mind, you know. And so... That type, that story, just one of many that we get to experience in the prison on a weekly basis as we go in. So I just thank God for restoring me to himself through the gift of grace, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank God for New Hope Ministry that does so much for the prison system. I thank God for Prison Fellowship Ministry where I get to go. I am on staff and I get to go in and share uh, with the inmates. So I'm just grateful, thankful to be able to share this and give hope to somebody who may be hopeless. Fred and Lilia, would you stand, please? Fred is in the service, and his wife, Lilia, had the privilege of marrying them about six years ago. All right. Fred, do me a favor. Come up just a minute. Fred, I want, I want Fred to come up a minute. Real quick. Um, most of you didn't know. You've sat by Fred before, probably in church, and, and you wondered, wow, uh, what a difference maker God has made in Fred's life. Uh, what a difference in those two pictures. This is one of the sweetest men you would ever meet, all right? I would never feel threatened by this man in my presence, all right? Um, God has done a great work in him. I want you to go stand on that step right there, all right, J just for a moment. Um, what group were you a part of when you were in prison that you had to break away from? Yeah, right there. Aryan Brotherhood. Aryan Brotherhood. What kind of group is that? So stand right there. Milo, Tim, would you come stand on either side of Fred? Here's what I want you to see. They are part of a brotherhood now. 
It is not a brotherhood of fighting. It is a brotherhood of love. It is a brotherhood of unity. And it all starts with confession and forgiveness. All right. <laughs> he did. He did. This is the brotherhood I want to be a part of. God bless you. Thank you, guys. Now, the notion that every relational conflict can be reduced to a single underlying problem may strike you as an extreme oversimplification. But if you'll track with me for the next few minutes, I think you're going to end up agreeing with me. And actually, you're not agreeing with me. This idea did not originate within my mind, nor, as I can tell, did it really originate in any of your minds. Where I find this is in the writings of a fellow by the name of James, who wrote part of a best-selling book and whose half-brother is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Those are pretty good credentials. Anyway, in the fourth chapter of his book, creatively titled James, he asks us a question that seems so open-ended it possibly couldn't have just a single simple answer. Notice how chapter 4 begins. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Wherever you work, whichever church you attend, whatever kind of dysfunctional family you grew up in, the answer to this question would seem to be as varied as the fights and the quarrels themselves. I'm tempted to ask, James, which quarrel are you talking about? Which fight are you referring to? Disagreements and arguments are caused by any number of circumstances, aren't they? James didn't think so. James thought there was a single cause. He peels back the circumstantial, he said, she said excuses, and he goes right to the heart of the matter. The common denominator for every relational struggle that you and I will ever have, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Look at the next verse. Next line. What causes fights and quarrels? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? James seemed to think that our external conflicts are the direct result of internal conflict that has worked its way to the surface. The word desire here means pleasures. In fact, the same Greek word is translated pleasures just a few more verses down. James believed that if you and I find ourselves in an argument, it's going to be because there is a battle within me that is spilled out onto you, or there is a battle in you that is spilled out on me. According to James, there are conflicting desires churning inside every one of us, and if we bump too hard, what's on the inside is going to spill out. Isn't it interesting that the people we hurt the most are those that we claim to love the most? The people who birthed us, who raised us, who exchanged vows with us, who hired us, who we hired. Why them? Why are they the ones who get hurt the most by us? James would say it's simple. They're in close proximity to you. When I can no longer contain the conflict raging within me, it spills out on those closest to me, even if they're innocent bystanders. Think about one of the most memorized verses in the Bible, found in Psalm 23. You get down to verse 4 or 5. My cup runneth over. And in that context, what David is talking about is when we have a healthy relationship with the shepherd, Goodness and mercy overflow in our life so that it spills out on those around us. James is telling us that same principle is true on the flip side. When we are not in healthy relationship with the shepherd, when we are struggling with the desires within our own heart that are not healthy for us, when those spill out and our cup runs over, it has the opposite effect of goodness and mercy. It has devastation and destruction. You see, the fact is, the common denominator in all of my relational conflicts is what? Me. The common denominator in all of your relational conflicts is who? Not me. It's you. We can't always get what we want. That's what is causing this internal struggle that threatens the peace of every home and office and church and menaces every relationship. James comes right out and he states it plainly. You want something, 
but you don't get it. There it is. It's found right there in that verse. We can't get what we want. We don't get our way. The term want, as used here, carries the force of I yearn for it. I lust for it. If we have children, then you're very familiar with what James is talking about. When you hear children fighting, you know instinctively the real issue isn't the toy. It's not the DVD or who gets to sit in which seat. The real issue is that two people want their way and one is not getting it. Uh, okay, you guys are going to have to stand for about eight minutes. All right? Or you can go, I'm just letting you know, I don't want you to stand too long, get tired out there. We got a little surprise at the end of this service. So hang on. Um, James argues the same is true about every adult conflict. And what do we do? We do whatever we have to do to get what we want. The second verse, the last part of the second verse of chapter 4 says, You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Ooh, did you get that? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. I suggest to you that kill in this verse might be a hyperbole, an exaggeration, although Fred would say it wasn't for him. We covet. We go so far to get what we want. Even more to the point, most murders had some kind of personal relationship with their victim. Investigators began often with the family or the closest of friends. Think about it. If you've ever been mad enough to hurt somebody, it was because that person didn't give you or someone you loved his or her due. You weren't getting what you wanted. James uses another interesting term in this passage. It's the word covet. This word, as used here, means to hotly pursue the picture is of someone who's constantly trying to meet a need they can't ever seem to get met. But in the end, I cannot get what I want. How can James say this? There are times when I get exactly what I want and I'm still not happy. James is looking beneath the surface at the desires that are constantly swirling around our heart. Hungers that are never fully and finally satisfied. Like my desire for food. I have an appetite to eat. I may feel full after a meal, but when the waiter or waitress comes by and says, dessert, <laughs> what do most of us say? I think I have a little room for dessert. Hey, we go have dinner two hours later. What room in the house are we poking around in? We're looking in there. Shall I say, Tim, what are you doing in there? Looking. <laughs> but I'm looking for something to satisfy. No matter how full you feel after a meal, we don't give up eating. The desires James is referring to in this passage represent unquenchable thirst and appetite. Our thirst and appetite for stuff, money, recognition, success, progress, intimacy, sex, fun, uh, relationships, partnerships, we never get enough of any of these things fully and finally satisfying our desires. In fact, C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, uh, says it this way. He says, the more you feed an appetite, the more it escalates in its intensity. Appetites grow through indulgence, not neglect. A drug addict who wants to get off drugs, do they get off drugs by taking more? Comes from abstinence. Gluttons think just as much about food as starving people do. People with power, what do they want? More power. Wealthy people often want more what? Wealth. Men and women who bounce from one partner to the next are never fully satisfied with any of them. You see, the point is, our desires and pleasures are not best dealt with by continually trying to satisfy them. And if that's a challenge for you, we have a ministry on Thursday nights. Dinner's at 5.30. Program starts at 6.30. It's called Celebrate Recovery. Remember that title. It's a very important word. We're going to come back to it next week. You can see for yourselves that our endless, fruitless attempts to satisfy our desires, these are the things that fuel our conflicts. Isn't it true that every relational struggle you've ever experienced can be reduced to the other person's trying to satisfy an internal desire in a manner that conflicts with the way you were planning to satisfy your desire? So we end up quarreling and fighting. Parents, what if you started using this James chapter 4 technique in dealing with your children? 
as a parenting technique. When you hear your kids arguing, instead of trying to sort out who did what first, make your kids sit down, look at each other, and repeat the following. Do you know what the problem is here? I'm not getting my way. What if your kids had to say that to each other? Andy Stanley, who wrote the book that is the premise for the series of sermons that we've been engaged with, he says, my kids hate it when I make them do that. But something very interesting happens. The energy level and the volume immediately drops in half. Most of the time, the kids are able to work it out, taking responsibility for what's going on. And on those instances, when as dad, I have to drill down a little further in the situation, I find out there's almost no defensiveness. They're starting to learn. The problem is, I want my way. The issue in every quarrel is we each want to get our own. Owning that makes a huge difference. When everybody involved owns their part, the problem usually evaporates. James was a pretty smart guy, wasn't he? You see, the blame game is what we usually like to do in trying to resolve personal conflicts. Whoever can blame the other one the most till we finally wear them down and they just give up and somebody wins and it's over. But folks, we got to stop blaming. Do you know what blame is? Blame actually is an admission that I can't be happy without your cooperation. Let me say that again. Blame is an admission that I can't be happy without your cooperation. To blame is to acknowledge dependence on the other person. If you don't act a certain way, I can't be satisfied or content. And if you will take this to its logical extreme, you can never be happy until you are able to control the actions and reactions of everybody you come in contact with. And that includes everybody on the road, in the lane next to you, and in front of you, and behind you. And if you can't, then there is no hope for you. Until we're willing to fully embrace the truth that James so clearly spells out here, we have no choice but to try to squeeze our happiness and contentment out of the people around us. But to add to the problem is this. Those other people we're trying to squeeze our happiness out of, they're trying to squeeze theirs out of us too. And eventually we all suffocate to death. We walk away convinced the problem is somebody else's. We walk away in search of someone else who can fill us up fully and finally. And in the busyness and earnestness of our search, we never stop long enough to figure out what it is we really want. So, what's the solution? James says, if you look at verse, the last of verse 2, you do not have because you do not have. Ask God. James says we need to go to the one who created us in the first place. Now isn't that a novel thought? Go to the one who gave us desires. Go to the one who gave us needs. Go to the one who created appetites in us. Let's share with him what our needs are. James says take everything to God. Now, in my office sometimes, in counseling with folks, whenever I suggest to some, some, this to somebody, do you know what I often hear? I already did that. Usually I discover that what I already did that means is I've already prayed about it. And I prayed about it usually means I prayed that God would change the heart of so-and-so who's not giving me what I think I deserve. That's what it really means. That's not what James is talking about. He's talking about something far more powerful than asking God to change someone else so that we can get our way. James is instructing us to bring our deepest needs, unmet desires to our Heavenly Father. He gives us permission to pour out our hearts in an unfiltered conversation with our Creator. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Have you ever done that? As, as Fred talked about in here, a guy sharing something he had never, ever shared before. Have you shared with God, unfiltered, your deepest needs and desires? That's what God our Father is asking us to do. You see, here's the deal. If it's important to you, then it's important to God. Because you are important to God. Don't begin your prayers with something like this, God, I know I shouldn't feel this way, but. Or God, I know this may sound petty, but. God, I should be more mature than this, but. Do you see the problem? Our butts get in the way. And we need to come to him unfiltered. I, I was in my late 20s, maybe I was even 30, when, when I, I learned what I was doing was so stupid. I used to sit and think about what I was going to pray before I prayed to God. Did you ever do that? 
how do I want to say this? And you know where I learned it from? Because sometimes I would think about how do I want to present this idea, this need, this desire that I had to my mom and dad so I would get the answer that I wanted. And so I would think about how am I going to set this up? And I used to do the very same thing. Before I would pray, I would think about, okay, how can I set this up so God will answer it in the way I want it answered? And one day, I know this is brilliant, one day it dawned on me, God heard all that. I was actually praying already to him while I was trying to figure out what to pray to him. And I didn't fool him one little bit. And yet God says, bring it all to me. Ask. And, and then in, in the last part of that, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. So he wants us to ask. Bring our desires to him and ask. Now, here's the kicker. With this, i got to wrap this up. He then says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. James says, the Father wants you to ask. But I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes he's going to say no. <laughs> Be ready for no. Aren't you glad he didn't say yes to every desire you've put before him? Because some of those desires would have ruined you. Some of you didn't take the no, and those desires ruined you. Come and ask. Learn how to hear no. And what I think you'll discover is when you bring everything to him, in time, you'll learn to ask for different things. Because you'll understand the value of God's will in your life. You see, in James chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good and perfect gift comes from above, comes down from the Father and the heavenly lights, who does not change. When we come to him and we've asked and we accept his answers, we know that what we have received is the good and perfect gift of God above. Not our unfulfilled appetites that we think might be so important. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but at the end of the day, Mick Jagger was right about one thing. You can't always get what you want. And he's absolutely right. Today, we've shared the solution to jealousy, to the endless frustration of the desires of our heart is to bring every request to God and settle on his answer. But I still haven't told you what the habit is we need to cultivate to keep jealousy out of our life. When discussing guilt, we know we need the habit of confession. When challenged with the problem of anger, we need forgiveness. When greed is trying to invade our hearts, generous giving is the habit to keep it at bay. The habit that will enable us to strengthen our hearts against jealousy is going to be shared next Sunday. <laughs> Though I gave it to you today, you may not have noticed, but we will talk about it next week.